Major funding for Election 2018 ballot initiatives is provided by AARP Arkansas. Hello again, everyone. Thanks very much for joining us. Per usual, Arkansas voters will see more than just the names of their candidates on the November ballots. We're being asked to decide five issues referred to the people by either the General Assembly or through citizen initiative. And it won't come as a surprise that most of them, in fact, all but one of them, is currently under legal challenge. And if the litigation is successful, the votes on that question or questions simply won't matter. For the moment, no matter. As every election year, we offer a voter's guide to ballot proposals just in case. And as always, we're escorted by a scrupulously nonpartisan, non-ideological team from the Public Policy Center of the University of Arkansas Systems Division of Agriculture, its Cooperative Extension Service. Its director is Dr. Stacy McCullough, assisted by program associate Kristen Higgins. Thanks very much for being with us. We see each other every couple of years. And yep. Yeah, it's part of the process and we're happy to be here. Well, let's just run down the, the ballot as we, in terms of the issues anyway. And we'll start with issue one, which is uh, colloquially referred to as tort reform. It does a little bit more than that. Ms. Higgins, do you want to start? Issue one is one of those proposals that has a lot of different things wrapped up into it. We've seen a couple of these over the past couple of years. And so this one has uh, four changes that it would um, make to the Arkansas Constitution. The first part is uh, putting a limit on how much attorneys can be paid by clients that they take on a contingency basis, which is usually an arrangement that an attorney and a client make ahead of time uh, that a, a lawyer would receive a certain amount of money um, that their client receives. Percentage so, amount. Right, a certain percentage. And so this proposal would have a one-third amount a limit put onto it so the attorney could receive 33 and a third percent of what their client recovers. Uh, the proposal would also establish a limit in how much a, a person could receive uh, in non-economic damages which are you know pain and suffering quality of life type of assessments that are um, chosen by a judge an attorney uh, and that limit would be $500,000, and the proposal would also set a limit on how much a uh, person could receive in punitive damages. And that uh, punitive damage limit would be $500,000 or a maximum of three times the amount of compensatory damages. And compensatory damages is another one of those terms that people might not necessarily be familiar with. That's uh, when you put together you know, pain and suffering plus medical bills and lost wages. So both types of economic damages. So you could say if you are um, received $25,000 in uh, non-economic and economic damages, then you might receive up to $500,000. Or if you receive a million dollars, then uh, the most that you could receive under this proposal would be $3 million. And so that's just part of it. So another uh, section of issue one would uh, allow the legislature to create rules for the court systems. And it would also uh, lower the number of votes that alleged the legislature would need to change or repeal court rules. So there's a lot of it, um, all those type of, of changes wrapped up into this one issue. Yeah, now court rules presently are set by the Arkansas Supreme Court has the authority to set court rules, to create court rules, changes. They, they have a process for that right now. And that has been the exclusive traditionally, I think it's fair to say that's traditionally been the, the, the well, exclusively the province of the courts itself or of the Supreme Court. Well, it's changed over time. When Arkansas was first created, the legislature had more authority and then rules changed over time and voters uh, passed an amendment that gave the Supreme Court more authority. Now, do we want to take a look at pros and or rather opponents and proponents of that? Sure. Well, the, the proponents say that this would attract uh, more doctors or keep more doctors 
uh, in Arkansas, uh, lower their uh, insurance limits, um, and it give the legislature uh, more authority to set rules. Um, the, the thinking is that you, know, you elect your legislature and the legislator is being, being response to you and to what you'd like. So that those are kind of the, the stances that the proponents of this are coming through. Uh, opponents to this say that um, it would uh, kind of violate the, the right between a client and their attorney to set their wage, their, their anticipated pay, that that's a personal contract. Um, and then opponents also say that um, it gives the legislature too much authority, that it violates the separation between the legislature and the judicial system. And we'll move on to uh, issue two with that. Dr. McCullough, it falls to you to uh, walk us through the one, I believe the one and only proposal that is not under legal challenge as we tape this broadcast anyway. That's correct. So issue two um, basically would require voters to present ID when they go to vote before they could receive their ballot. Um, it's an amendment to Article Three of the state's constitution. Um, if you are voting absentee, you would have to submit copy, um, like a photocopy of your uh, identification with your ballot for it to be counted. If for some reason you showed up to vote and you didn't have your um, ID with you, then you would have to, um, you could cast a provisional ballot, but then you'd have to take steps to prove your identity at a later time um, within, within constraints that would be set by the legislature. So there's a lot of pieces of this. That's the basic premise. Um, there are lots of pieces of this that would have to be established by some further legislation that um, the General Assembly would have to pass. Part of that would be what is the process, what are, what are the forms of ID that would be acceptable. And then there's also a, pr a provision that if you don't have one of the two yet to be determined forms of identification that could be used, the state would have to issue you some type of an identification card free of charge. Um, and so what that would look like, what documents you would need to be eligible to get that, all of that would be determined by the legislature um, through subsequent legislation. So basically issue two, if enacted, would call it a stage setter, opens the door for the General Assembly to, or would require the General Assembly in effect to take it from there. Yeah, it, it lays out some responsibilities that they would have to do to make this implementable. Um, you know, one of the other things about it is it, it does allow the legislature to create some exceptions to the rule, um, but it doesn't really give any specific examples or uh, what that might look like. Um, you know, a lot of people, their first question is going to be, well, I'm already asked to give an ID when I vote, so what's the difference? And so that's a, you know, this is something that's um, over time, different pieces of legislation have tried to address this. So uh, back in 2000, was it 13? I think in 13, um, this legislature passed a voter identification uh, law that was struck down by the courts later. Um, so in a subsequent year, through sub subsequent legislation, they um, made it a requirement just to verify your voter registration. So you don't necessarily need it to get your ballot, but you have to vote, you need it to verify you're who you say you are. And so um, this is kind of, by putting it in the Constitution, that basically takes away some of the legal challenges that could occur um, based on current code that we have. And a quick look at the pro and or the for and against. You know, you're not sides. letting us leave any secrets to our uh, voter guide. And um, you know, proponents of it think that, or they're saying that um, this is really important to ensure the integrity of our elections. We know that there's been lots of questions about elections over time, and so that they feel that this is a way to shore up that and make sure everyone who's voting is supposed to be voting. Um, opponents, on the other hand, are saying, you know, there's not a lot of evidence that says that this type of activity is happening, that people are voting that aren't supposed to vote. And so they don't, they see this as maybe setting a barrier um, for populations that maybe don't have easy access to the forms of identification to, you know, they're making it harder for them to, to actually cast a ballot. So uh, we have additional pros and cons of each of the issues in our voter guide. And so we encourage people to uh, read that thoroughly and check out our website to see more information. Issue three, and we'll go back to Ms. Higgins. Now this is commonly called the term limits, fair enough, the term limits uh, proposal. And uh, it, would, it would be pretty significant. Right, so no this other, would. No other, you're for or against it, pretty significant. 
It, this would shorten the number of years that uh, senators and representatives can serve in the state. Uh, it would reduce the number of years from 16 that they can currently serve to a maximum of 10 years. It would establish a limit of two four-year terms in the Senate and three two-year terms in the House of Representatives. Uh, right now, as you're probably aware, uh, the legislature can serve um, uh, in either way, in either the House or the Senate, up to 16 years at the moment. And that was something that voters approved back in 2014 as part of a, a larger constitutional amendment. So this would uh, set a, a, a shorter term of office for our legislature. And this would, when we talk in terms of the impact, this would have a significant impact on the sitting General Assembly or the next one to sit, let's put it that way. Right. It would reduce the number of people who would be eligible to uh, serve in the next couple of years. Our legislature has some people who have served a, a fair number of years, and so they would be running up against uh, the 10-year limit. Um, if they are elected to a seat this year uh, and this proposal passes, uh, you know, this proposal would take effect in January, so they would be able to serve out that last term. But there are a number of senators who would not be eligible anymore, um, and then there are some uh, representatives who uh, would be over that maximum as well. And um, just, you know, sometimes people say that every election is a potential term limit for somebody. So that's what some of the supporters have said of, about that. Well, the, perhaps the most, or one of the most significant aspects is that it is immediately retroactive, as you noted. Right, it would go, it would go back to people who have served since the early 90s. So if you had served back in 93, 94, th that time period, and you wanted to come back, well, you would fall under these limits. So let's look at the pros and the cons or, or what the advocates and the opponents say. Sure, well the supporters say that uh, they want uh, the General Assembly to be more reflective of Arkansas as it is now and that there are legislators who serve longer than they feel is needed and that this would give people more opportunity to join the General Assembly and, and reduce um, the uh, ability for people to be there for a long time. Um, and then opponents say, well, that just undercuts all the experience that people have built up over the years and uh, making people perhaps more susceptible to lobbyists or more um, uh, needing some more time to catch up. And by the time that they catch up, that they would be running up against the term limits and have to leave. Issue four, and back to Dr. McCullough. Not for the first time <laughs> in recent Arkansas history is there a proposal involving wagering, in fact, casinos on the Arkansas ballot. Yep. Issue four. Yeah, so this year's um, proposal, it, it was a citizen-initiated petition, um, and it's basically would authorize four casinos in our state. So one would be located at or adjacent to Oaklawn in Hot Springs. One would be at Southland. Um, in conjunction with the Greyhound Park there. Um, and then two additional ones would be open for licenses. Um, so one of those would be operated in Jefferson County within two, mi within two miles of Pine Bluff, and then the other would be in Pope County within two miles of Russellville. Um, and so that's the overall premise. Uh, there's lots of detail about this uh, within the actual uh, ballot measure. Um, so it would define what, what casino gaming means. Um, it would prohibit people under 21 from engaging in that. It would allow the casinos to serve alcohol um, whenever they're open. Um, in terms of licensing and regulation, it would give that authority to the Arkansas Racing Commission. And they currently have authority over um, our, our Greyhound Park and our horse racing parks. Um, it also would require the Racing Commission to work with the Arkansas Department of Human Services. Is that it? Human Services. Mm -hmm. DHS. <laughs> Sometimes I keep going back and forth between health and human services. But um, basically, and that would be, that partnership would be trying to address issues related to compulsion gambling. Um, so there is some measure within this to try to address some of the social issues that would occur in conjunction potentially with gambling. Um, it establishes how the casinos would be taxed and how that tax revenue is distributed. Um, it also uh, would uh, provide some provisions in how 
the casinos are, you know, how much money would be set aside for purses and that sort of thing. Um, let's see, what else? There's a lot of different parts of that. Um, the licenses in Pope County and Jefferson County would be up for renewal every 10 years, and again, the Arkansas Racing Commission would deal with that. So I encourage people, this one has a lot of parts, uh, similar to a few of the other issues, and so really want to research it and, and make sure that you're aware of all the parts that are, that are entailed. Well, in there. fact, some of the parts are missing by design uh, because they are left to the administrative uh, state, so to speak the Racing sure. Commission, DHS. Yeah. So, and the legislature would also enact laws and provide um, appropriations to help operate um, and oversee this through the Arkansas Racing Commission. So, yeah. All right, the advocates, so, oh, by the way, let's take a look at how the tax money <laughs> would be would be distributed. Sure. Um, and I can't, I'll be honest, I'm not sure I remember the exact percentages off the top of my head, but a portion of it would go to the state general revenue fund. So that's money that the state can use for a variety Schools, of prisons, operations. Yeah, pretty much however they would like to use it. Um, some of it would go to the cities where the uh, casinos are operating. Um, if they're not in a city, it would go to the county. Uh, that city share would go to the county, but then also if it is in a city, a portion of that would also go to county government. So both city and county government would potentially have a piece of that. Um, some of the revenue would go to the Racing Commission for to help offset the expenses that they would incur related to that. And then um, some of it obviously it would go to the racing purses that are um, part of uh, our Greyhound and horse racing tracks. Okay, and its proponents would say, would argue, yeah, so our proponents would say people are crossing state lines, we're losing tax money, um, that this would create jobs for our state. Um, so they have several reasons why they think this is an important thing for our state to have. Um, the opponents, on the other hand, um, really kind of see this as, you know, something that's not needed. Um, we do have uh, games of skill that are offered at our racetracks, um, so you can still do some of this type of activity, and they really just feel that the social costs are would outweigh the potential benefits that might be associated with it. And there are some concerns also about um, the Constitution saying where these would be located. So uh, lots of arguments, again, on both sides and lots of groups out in support and opposing the issue. So. Again, more information in the voter guide as well as just contacting those supporters and opponents to get more about their perspective. All right, on to issue five, minimum wage. Now, we have been here before, Ms. Higgins. Right, uh, voters approved the current minimum wage in 2014. And just like back then, issue five is an initiated act, which means it's a state law, it's not a constitutional amendment. So this state law would uh, possibly it would increase the minimum wage from $8.50 to $9.25 and then the following year it would go up to $10 and then ultimately up to $11 an hour. So these mandated increases would apply to? These would apply to anyone with four or more employees uh, in businesses that are not exempt already under state law. Arkansas state law has some very specific laws that um, say, you know, certain agricultural jobs are exempt, uh, jobs where gratuities or tips are customary are exempt from paying the minimum wage, and then there's actually some laws saying some very small newspapers are exempt from the minimum wage. Uh, so if your uh, business is not already exempt under state law and you have more than four employees, this would apply to you. Let's take a look at the advocates and the opponents, the two views, the opposing sides. Right, so supporters are saying that you know, this would increase the, the wages for um, the working poor, that uh, people would have the ability to spend more money and it would stimulate the economy. Uh, and then opponents are worried that this would hurt small businesses, that businesses uh, would have to either cut hours or not hire as, much, uh, as many employees. So you have people on both sides of the spectrum saying it's good for the economy or it's bad for the economy. And there's more information in our, in our voter guide that kind of goes into uh, what economists have been saying about the issue. Let's take a look at that voter guide for just a second, if we may. This is uh, a splendid service, if I may say so, of the Cooperative Extension Service. And your organization has earned a reputation over the years for scrupulous, as I said at the top of the broadcast, 
broadcast, scrupulous nonpartisanship, free of any ideologies. Fact, fact, fact. Tell us about how it came to be. Yeah, so we've been doing this every year since 2004, and it really came because we saw a need for it. There were lots of issues being proposed or maybe that people were voting on or really ignoring. So people would go to the ballot, they'd vote for their candidates, and then they'd get to the issues and they wouldn't vote because they really weren't expecting them or they didn't know what would happen. And so we uh, kind of put together a process. It's a very thorough process. That's one of the reasons it takes us so long to get them put together. Uh, because not only do we do an analysis and try to utilize all the information that we have, we send it to subject matter experts, we send it to legal experts, we send it to supporters and opponents. We want them to review it, make sure we've got their strongest arguments, make sure everyone feels that we've got as neutral a, and non-biased uh, publication as that we can have. Um, so that process takes several months and we work very hard at it. So we definitely encourage if people have concerns about it, please bring those to our attention because we're always looking for ways of improving that process. The guide, you, one might say, is thoroughly vetted. <laughs> it is, but I will also say this. We can't put everything in the guide. I mean, there's, we could do pages and pages right. and pages of this. So it's always a balancing act between what are the important things that we can share within a time or a space constraint that people will actually read. So. Um, we have additional information on our website, on our monthly newsletter that we do. We post updates, so the court challenges, if you're interested in kind of following along, we'll give updates on social media and on our website about what's happening with those. So we have a lot of information, and all of that's available through our website at uaex.edu slash ballot. Without commenting on merits or motivation, it cannot help the process any that every <laughs> Every two years, these ballot issues, whether referred or, or uh, originated out by the citizen, uh, citizen initiatives, they're under legal challenge every year. So that slows the process, I would think, Ms. Higgins, quite a bit. Right. So we doesn't help speed the research. Well, I, I don't think it necessarily affects the research. It's more so when we publish, when we hit you know print, that we're having to be very aware of the fact that some of those ballot issues might not even be on the ballot or voters might be uh, confused even more about if they're getting to vote, if they're not getting to vote. So we do mark on there which ones are being challenged in court and as Stacy mentioned we update our websites to say this one is under court challenge or if it's struck from the ballot then we update our information online. So we do have you know, a chance to do a lot of research ahead of time, it's just the last mile. So the guide actually is not written in stone. It's a, the guide is written on paper, but it's also <laughs> on the net. and It's printed, uh, but the online version, we have the ability to update if necessary. How can we get one? Again, so you can contact your county extension office. We have offices in every county in the state of Arkansas, so just give them a call or stop by. Uh, we should be shipping those out. Um, within the next week or so, and they'll be available. Um, again, you can look at it online through our website, uaex.edu slash ballot, B-A-L-L-O-T. And I think we can put that up on the screen if we That'd have not, in, in fact, already. This, how long does the, pro when does the process begin? Walk us through that. Tomorrow, <laughs> well, <laughs> the day after not, the election. Not updated. Sure, sure. Well, uh, it's it's ongoing. It's constant. So, you, as you're aware, the, when the legislature meets, that they uh, submit their proposals to uh, discuss ballot proposals. And so, we're watching when they're doing that. We're reading all the ba the bills that are filed, and it just we follow them along through the process. And then we start as soon as they're done. Start researching and writing, and then. There's certain deadlines that citizen initiatives have to follow and we keep track of what they're doing. And we have a monthly email newsletter that we uh, update um, everybody on. So here's what was submitted this month and here's what's uh, the, where the process is at and here's who's made it and who hasn't made it. And uh, we, it never stops. Yeah, in fact, there's groups also, the citizen groups, they can submit at any time mm -hmm. for the next election. And so we're constantly monitoring what's being submitted, what's the attorney general ruling on, whether they can go forward and collect signatures. So it really is a year-round process. So, yeah, in, in other words, your work will begin anew on the Wednesday follow, or maybe even on the Tuesday night of election night. Right. Well, there was an email in my inbox yesterday 
from the Attorney General's office with their opinion on a proposal that did not meet the merit. So we, we follow them constantly. We're looking ahead to 2020 right, right now. <laughs> All right, Dr. McCullough, Ms. Higgins, thanks so much from the Cooperative Extension Service, Division of Agriculture, University of Arkansas. Thanks so much for being Thank with you. us again this year. Thank we'll you. see you in two years, I feel relatively certain. Sounds Thank good. you for joining us. See you next time. Major funding for Election 2018 ballot initiatives is provided by AARP Arkansas.